Hello everyone, this is Dr. Ahmed Ergin. I'm an endocrinologist and today we are going to talk about when to check the blood sugars. This is a very common question in my practice that I hear every day. Now, rightfully, people ask how many times should I check because it hurts, especially if you're doing finger sticks, that sucks. If you have a CGM like a Dexcom G6 Freestyle Libre, whatever, great. But even then, you sometimes have to do finger checks and most of the time people don't even understand when to do finger checks when they are wearing a CGM. If they are using a regular meter, then that's another story that you have to understand how many times because you don't want to check too many times and you don't want to check too many, few, too little, too few times. You don't want to check too few, too few times. So basically, we are going to start with the easiest patient. So, Basic, let's talk about a patient who just got diagnosed with diabetes. They're super nervous. They are checking their blood sugar seven, eight times a day. Well, initially, that may be exciting and, and you know, you're, you're, you're worked up, you want to get this under control. Great. But eventually, you are going to burn out. So, there are easier way to do this than just doing seven, eight times a day. Now, if you are really wanting to, you know, still have an understanding of where your blood sugars are without doing eight times a day, do the scattered matter. So scatter your blood sugar checks, but make sure that it's organized so your doctor and yourself can actually look at it and have an understanding. Now, for example, if you want to check your blood sugar twice a day, this is how you can organize. You can do one day, first thing in the morning at fasting, which is important, and then the second blood sugar check could be an hour or two after breakfast. But make sure you're consistent. Let's say if you want to do one hour after breakfast, keep doing that one hour after meals, if you're going to do after lunch or after dinner, and keep it, make sure that it's one hour after. So, so in, because if you're doing one hour one day and then two hours one day, then, then it becomes confusing. So let's say one day you do it for breakfast on Monday. On Tuesday, you can do a blood sugar check before lunch and after lunch, one hour after. On a Wednesday, you can do the same thing before and after. You just change the meal time, but still stick to the two times a day. That way you have an understanding of what your blood sugars are before and after breakfast, before and after lunch, before and after dinner. Now what a lot of people do, they start checking their blood sugar first in the morning and then before bedtime. And they keep doing the same thing. Now, if your blood sugar is especially similar in the morning, similarly high or similarly low, now some people say, oh, my blood sugar was 180 yesterday, today is 160, why is that? You know what? Not a big deal. It's still high. It's, of course, what you eat and what you do, physical activity, everything affects it. But the bottom line, you're running overall high. So there's no point of rediscovering or trying to get hung up on 160, 165, 175. Don't worry about it. It's high. It needs to be fixed. Move on to see where the other problems are. Now, what people think that the 160 for some people, they say, oh, it's okay. I can live with that. But then when they check their blood sugar after eating, after breakfast, they realize that they go sometimes up to 250. And, and then they don't know that unless they check it. Uh, now, that is the scattered method, method, and I think that's the best way to do it, especially if you have limited amount of strips. If you cannot afford strips or just you just hate your pricking your fingers, then try to be wise and try the scattered method. method especially if you're new. Now, if you are not so new and you're on certain medications or you are diet managed and you're doing well, uh, now how many times do you really check your blood sugars? Well, in this case, you don't really have to do too many times. If you just do, if, you, if it's going to make you comfortable once a day in the morning just to keep a trap on it, tap on it, you can do that. Uh, but on the other hand, if you want to, you know, occasionally you check after meals, or let's say you think that you had too much carbs, uh, you want to check for it, be my guest, check for it so you understand how food affects you and so forth. Uh, but if you're overall well controlled and you're waking up with, you know, say 100, you know, 110, and then occasionally you check after meals and you never go more than 160, 170 after meals, then you're pretty well controlled. Again, for some people, it's not well controlled, but 
I'm talking about the general purposes, you know, because our goals for diabetes depends on the age, depends on the patient. Sometimes we are very strict with patients. Let's say a pregnant patient. We want to keep him less than 90 in the morning. There's a different beast. Uh, I was saying beast. Uh, in terms of the disease state, this is a different beast for a pregnant woman uh, than a 80-year-old uh, frail uh, woman. So we don't tell them, oh, you have to wake up below 90 because we know that they're gonna be at risk of dropping their blood sugar and at that age, it can be very hard on them and it can actually be very dangerous. So what we try to do here, we are trying to uh, manage risk based on the patient. So uh, that's why your doctor should give you the goals, you know, exactly what your goals should be, or you should just understand the guidelines well. So what is your personal goal should be between you and your physician typically? Although, we'll make a video uh, right after this about what your general guidelines are for blood sugars. Now, in summary, we recommend checking blood sugar a few times a week if you are very stable, just to keep an eye on it. Because sometimes people totally drop checking blood sugars and then the next thing they know that they're in the 200s again. You don't want to do that either. So, don't be too obsessed. Uh, don't be too uh, loose. Uh, just find a middle ground, but I would suggest that break the habit. You know, if you're checking it every morning, and if it is every morning 120, just stop it, just because it's not changing. You're not really discovering anything new. Um, so, and then your diet is not changing. Nothing, you know, then you can check it in different times, a couple times a week, just to have a general idea. Uh, but overall, that is what I would recommend. Now, of course, uh, if you're on insulin, that's a little different story. So if somebody is on basal insulin, this could be Elantis, this could be Levomir, this could be Traceba or Tujeo, whatever you're on, or MPH. Uh, in this case, uh, I would suggest checking the blood sugar before you go to bed and then before you wake up. Now, the reason for that, and especially initially, especially in the titration stage where we don't exactly know how much insulin you need, but we start you from somewhere and we titrate you to the goal. Uh, in that stage, you always have to want to check the blood sugar at night and in the morning. Now, what a lot of people don't understand with uh, why we're doing this is the, the, the reason is the long-acting insulins, guys, are designed to keep your blood sugar stable. Now, overnight and during the day as well, your liver is constantly making blood sugar. Now, that is regulated by insulin and insulin sensitivity. When you're insulin resistant, when you have diabetes, you know, your liver does not realize that there's some insulin, so it keeps making too much sugar. So to overcome the resistance, you know, if you're not able to exercise and do good dieting, etc., or it, it may not be enough, just simply diet and exercise is just sometimes not enough. Uh, in those cases, we start a basal insulin just to keep the blood sugar stable. That's why a lot of people wake up with a high blood sugar in the morning, just because their liver constantly makes sugar, especially after four o'clock at night or in the morning. Um, in the morning, four, four o'clock in the morning, I would say, you know, the growth hormone kicks in and all that other stuff kicks in and then you're, you're, you wake up with a very high blood sugar. That's very depressing for a lot of people. So what we do is we just put a basal insulin and that way we, re we what we are trying to do is the bedtime blood sugar and the morning blood sugar should pretty much be similar. Now, you will never wake up with the same blood sugar. So forget about, you know, keeping your blood sugar like on a flat line. That doesn't happen. You don't see flat line in any human body. So everything constantly is changing. Everything affects your blood sugar. So uh, it's not like a heart rate, even your heart rate. When you get up a little bit, your heart rate changes and so forth. Uh, but with the blood sugars, it constantly change, especially if you're not, you know, a normal person. Like, you know, normal people will wake up around 80, 90. Uh, but when you're diabetic, you know, there's a lot of factors playing into it. But if you are waking up with a blood sugar of, let's say, less than 120, that's great. But we don't want to start at 200 at nighttime. So we want to make sure that your blood sugar is similar. Now, what a lot of people do wrong, they try to give too much basal insulin to try to control morning numbers. Well, that's a problem because we don't want you to go down like this overnight that's very dangerous so we want to keep your blood sugar very stable when you are when you are sleeping we want to keep it like as straight as possible now if there is 20 30 plus minus difference that's very acceptable uh, because that's not going to put you to danger zone let's say you go to bed with, with 120 you know if you wake up with 90 that's not a big deal uh, but if your blood sugars are 
typically dropping 100 points overnight uh, because of the insulin, then you are putting yourself at significant risk of going very low uh, with the insulin. So the goal of the basal insulin, again, is to keep the blood sugar stable overnight. So that's why checking blood sugar at nighttime and in the morning is extremely important. Um, now, once you're stable and you know, you're a pretty regular person and nothing is really changing in your life, you don't have to keep repeating that cycle. Uh, you can maybe just check your blood sugar at nighttime to make sure it's not too low before you go to bed. Um, and then people are really scared of insulin because most of the time they are prescribed too much insulin or patients sometimes do their own thing based on their own ideas and they just increase their insulin thinking that it's gonna, they're gonna have a better blood sugar. Well, that's true, but you don't wanna haphazardly increase your blood sugar just to control your morning numbers without having an idea about nighttime numbers. So definitely consult with your doctor. At SugarMDs, you know, we basically monitor you all the time. So we have the cellular systems where if we are sending you a, a, a meter that actually transfers data electronically to us. So if you are going to bed with 200 and waking up with a 70, we immediately realize and we call you and, you know, see what's going on. And of course, most of our patients don't get to that stage because we never over insulinize our patients. Uh, but we have a system where we can remotely monitor you without even you having to call us. We will call you to make sure everything is staying stable and straight. Now, if you are on one-time insulin, that is the way to go. And you can still check your blood sugars uh, occasionally after meals uh, based, you know, and it doesn't have to be all the time. Let's say your doctor may say, okay, we now controlled your blood sugars. You are waking up less than 120, 110. Uh, and you're consistent, your uh, nighttime blood sugars are not horrible. Uh, but if you're, if you're waking up at 120 and your blood sugar starts climbing up to 180, 200 by the, by the time you go to bed, you know, what we need to address is the blood sugar spikes after you eat. So what we typically ask patients, if their fasting blood sugars are not bad, but then they, their blood sugars are high during the day, um, then we ask them about their blood sugars after they eat. So I tell them, okay, check your blood sugar one day after breakfast, one day after lunch, one day after dinner. Again, we try not to do too many finger sticks. We try to keep it to minimum. So I tell them that, and then uh, they bring it. And if I see blood sugar spiking more than 180, 200 after certain meals, that's a red flag. We try to adjust their diets, so of course, reduce the carbs or exercise more, etc. If they can, great. If they cannot, then we have to do something about this. We have a lot of great medications as well uh, that help control the blood sugar spikes after meals. Again, not everybody is the same. Some people do great with diet and exercise, but depending on the disease state status, you know, some type one diabetics, for example, they have to take insulin with meals. Some patients with type one and a half diabetes, they have to take insulin. Now, some people think that if you stop eating sugar, your diabetes will be fixed. Well, that's not the case. That's that's the case for, I will say, you know, quite a bit of people, maybe 50% of people, but uh, that's generally true at the, at the beginning stage of type two diabetes. And even like if you have been diabetic for 20 plus years of type two diabetes, it becomes hard to control your diabetes just with that and exercise guys. So in my practice, I see a lot of complicated cases. Those cases that people discuss on the YouTube and other places, they're simple new diabetics, you know, they just stop eating carbs and they, they think they're fixed. Uh, but diabetes is not a disease like that. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's it's a, flaw, it's a very philosophical disease. Most people don't understand uh, what it what it is really entails. Everybody thinks it's just a sugar problem, and it's not. Uh, and we'll talk about that in other videos. But but the bottom line is. If you're checking your blood sugars uh, twice a day, you can stagger it. And if you're on insulin one time a day at night and in the morning to kind of make sure they're stable. And then once your fasting blood sugars are stable, we look at your blood sugars after meals, again, by checking your blood sugars, you know, after certain meals. Now, who needs to check their blood sugar four or more times? Those are the people who really take insulin for uh, three times a day with their meals. And four times actually with one basal insulin and three meal time, you know, for type one and a half diabetics sometimes or type one diabetics or some two, of course, advanced type two diabetics do that, some multiple injections a day. And the reason they have to do multiple injections a day, uh, multiple testing a day actually, is the fact that they really need to know, know their blood sugars before they take insulin because the fast-acting insulins actually drop your blood sugars very rapidly. So uh, there are two ways of taking the rapid-acting insulin. One is for correction, and the second is for the food, for the carbohydrates. Now, 
of course, you know, if you're going to be like 200 before you eat, you need to know that so that actually you can take a little bit of extra insulin to correct the 200 number. Um, so, uh, and then the same thing applies. If your blood sugars are down to 70, you may want to take a couple units off of your regular scheduled dose so that you avoid a low blood sugar. So monitoring also helps you understand overall how you're doing. Let's say you check your blood sugar before breakfast one day and then second day, you know, uh, after you check it uh, before lunch, right? So you check it before breakfast and before lunch uh, if you're on insulin before meals. So let's say your blood sugar goes up quite a bit every time. Uh, after you eat. So you have a breakfast, but by the lunchtime it should be down, but you're still at the 160, 170 range by the lunchtime, uh, then you know that you actually need to take more insulin. So that's very important to be able to adjust your insulin, to be able to give your doctor some data to have him or her understand what's going on with your blood sugars. If your blood sugars, for example, are all over the place, then maybe maybe you need to pay attention to your diet a little bit more to try to fix your, you know, uh, consistency problem or carbohydrate counting problem, you know, because if you're taking, say, 10 units of insulin for every breakfast and then your blood sugar one day uh, drops down to 90 by, by lunchtime and uh, another day goes to 190, uh, that means that what you're eating probably is very different. So you have to understand the consistency of your um, your, of your eating, uh, etc. So this, this is a different topic we discussed earlier, uh, but that's why checking blood sugar four times a day at least is important. Uh, sometimes we tell patients to check it after meals as well if we are suspecting certain high blood sugars. And in endocrinology practice, in diabetes practices, we sometimes perform a professional glucose monitoring, which is a short-term CGM, short-term continuous glucose monitoring, to see where they are spiking. That kind of helps us a little bit more than just relying on patients. Now, um, now also in my practice, what I really love about is is those cellular meters. So because every time they check their blood sugar, it comes to me, so I don't have to really beg for the numbers. I find myself uh, you can you can call my second name as a beggar because I really beg for these numbers. Like, hey, did you bring your blood sugars? Uh, oh, I forgot at home. It's on the desk. It's on the canopy. It's on somewhere. It's in the car. Uh, or I didn't write it, I, I forgot, I checked, I didn't write it, you know, um, et cetera. So all these excuses just used to drive me crazy. Uh, but now uh, we make patients with diabetes life easy. You know, either we give them a CGM, you know, they carry the CGM. Now, since we jumped to CGMs, let's talk about when to check your blood sugars when you're using a CGM. Now, the CGM um, companies like Dexcom or Freestyle Libre or Medtronic, they advertise no finger sticks, no finger sticks, just use it, no finger sticks. Well, that is true to a point, but they don't really tell you the downsides of the products they sell. Now, here's what happens if you're in a CGM like Dexcom or Freestyle Liberate. Since Dexcom or any CGM is somewhat delayed um, after, you know, when the blood sugars are changing rapidly, and, and if you look at the fine print, you will see that they actually warn you about that. If your blood sugars are changing rapidly, your Dexcom is not going to be true. Like one typical example that a lot of people do wrong, uh, the Dexcom will show that their blood sugar is low, and it's true, it's typically low, it's, it's generally correct, although Freestyle Libre has not been the most uh, correct CGM when it comes to low blood sugar alerts and stuff. But, um, and they don't even have alerts, but you know, sometimes they tell it's low, but it's not low with the Freestyle. Now with the Dexcom, Let's say you have a low, and then you eat something, and then the Dexcom keeps showing it's low. And then they keep eating more and more. And the next thing, the Dexcom shows like your blood sugar is 300 now. Well, the reason for that is there is a delay, as we discussed on our previous video, on the Dexcom D6 versus Libre video, or Dexcom or CGMs are explained video. In that video, we tell you guys that there is a delay. So you cannot really rely on a CGM when you have a low blood sugar. So what you do, you eat something, 15, 20 grams of carbohydrates, like simple carbs, candy, etc., and then you check it in 15, 20 minutes with a finger stick. Then your finger stick may tell you your blood sugar is 120, and your Dexcom may still say your blood sugar is 75. So, so as a result, guys, so this is the point where I want to make, if your blood sugar shows that your Dexcom shows that your blood sugar is 300, you decide to take some insulin, okay? So half an hour, you check it, one hour uh, after you check it, you want to check your blood sugar with a finger stick. Uh, yes, Dexcom will show the trend 
you know, that's always a good thing to know that your blood sugar is now rising or going down based on what you have done. But the exact numbers is not going to be true when your blood sugar is going really high or really low based on what you have done. In this case, when you have a low, you ate something, your blood sugar is going up, Dexcom is going to be way behind. When you took insulin, your blood sugar is coming down fast, your Dexcom is going to be behind. Uh, so as a result, in those cases where the things are extreme or not right, not, not normal, uh, you want to do your finger sticks uh, and then rely on that a little bit more. If you catch your low blood sugar, like when Dexcom tells you your blood sugar is going to be low and you catch it before it's low, then, then you, you're much better luck. But when you're bottoming out or you're already down to 50 uh, or you're already 300, uh, you may want to go with the finger sticks at that stage. Now, I hope that video was helpful, guys, and make sure you give us a thumbs up uh, and make sure you subscribe. Now, we are going to move on to a stage where we discuss patient cases, like real patients, real treatments, real outcomes. And although I may not be able to reply to you in person uh, to your case, uh, because I have to take a lot of information and that requires time and energy, you can be our patient. You know, if you're watching us from Florida and New York, sign up to our services. In Florida, we accept insurance. In New York, we don't. Um, but if you are one of our patients, regardless, we'll take care of the best we can. Uh, and we are going to give you all the resources we have. Uh, but if you're a YouTube watcher from some another country or some another state in the United States, um, then, you know, we can look at your case. We can present as a anonymous case uh, just because it's legal issues where, well, when we don't really know you well, we cannot give you uh, medical advice. So, but uh, I will definitely pick up cases from my practice and will present to you and maybe it will be a similar case to you and you may learn from that. And that is the goal. We will do that at 30,000 subscribers. So make sure you have more, get more subscribers for us so we can get to that stage where we can be a lot more useful. Thank you for watching. We'll see you in the next video.